Episode 33, Forces of Will. Welcome back, dear listeners. When we left Pink, she had gone to Starlight to inquire about this unknown force. But someone was waiting. What's in store for our hero? She swallows and takes a breath. Someone whips the hood off. Pink <sighs> blinks against the light. It is dim and golden. Even so, more light all of a sudden makes dots in her view. It takes a minute for her eyes to focus. She notices she's tied to the chair. She is in a wood cabin. It is neat and clean. The end wall is covered in a smooth river stone. The roaring fireplace looks like an open mouth. The mustache of the mantle is cluttered with small metallic toys that catch the firelight and glimmer. There is a portrait of the countryside between two round windows, which finish out the face with star-filled eyes. In the square beam, open rafters, lurk mechanical animals in various positions. It gives the effect of too much taxidermy used as a decoration. It's a little unnerving. A small noise brings her attention back to the room at eye level. Next to the fireplace is a chunky round table and chair. Occupying the chair is an average looking man. He'd been so quiet she hadn't noticed him till now. He sits hunched over a tiny machine on the table. He has soft ashy hair pressed down by jeweler's goggles. He wears tan overalls and bunny slippers. Excuse me. Hmm. Where am I precisely? And is it really necessary to have me tied up? You were a guest in my home. And for now, I think I can safely untie you. The ropes vanish, and Pink rubs her wrists. Thank you. You've been watching me, and now you're bold enough to come yourself. I saved you the time of having to locate me. Then you must be Sirik. Yes. Pink stands and looks around. Water in the basin, fire in the fireplace. At least I have something to work with. She backed up to the fire and scanned the rest of the room. It looked alarmingly similar to her parents' cabin in the woods. She could just see the corner of the chicken house through an open window. Was he messing with her? She saunters closer to the table and looks over his work. What are you working on? A clockwork fish for my collection. The tinkering reminds her of Otto. She wonders if they can even hear her. She stretches out her feelings, but it goes nowhere. There are whispers about you on the side, you know. I was hoping to meet you. Pink stands still, not sure what to do. The kettle behind him begins to steam. He looks over and indicates that she should pour him a cup. Without knowing why, she does. She moves back to sit across the room. He stops her and indicates the newly materialized chair. Sit. She sits, watching him fiddle with the tiny clockwork fish. For a long time, he says nothing. Pink sits still, spreading her senses out. This room isn't even warded, at least not on the inside. Tell me about yourself. I didn't bring you here for silence. What don't you know? Not a lot. You are fairly transparent. Well, then why ask? I like to know what people think they are. I'd rather know what I really am. There's a prophecy about you. I brought you here because I wanted to see if I could figure you out. So, have you decided anything? I see a small little girl looking for her father's love and approval. That is why you serve the god of your system, isn't it? I suppose. I'm not ignorant to my issues. After so many years, you decide which battles are worth fighting and which aren't. <laughs> what about our battle? Is it worth fighting? Oh, that depends on what you plan to do. I intend to do what I was sent to do. Protect my system. Old champion. <laughs> you would best serve your system by dumping your god. <laughs> Did you know he's an outsider from my system? No, they've been pretty quiet about their actual nature. He is. And if you knew what your system would be like without his control, you might walk away now. What would it be like? Lucy thinks it'll be chaotic lawlessness. Come now, how much can you believe in controlled opposition? She is ambitious to get out from underneath his power, but she cannot. She's a paper doll, an illusion of competition. He could easily destroy her, but without the drama, the story isn't interesting for him. To me, she is useless. What do you mean? 
He can't live like you do, so he must live through you. Just as he lives out his fantasies by living through Lucy and her ilk. Why? He's bored. When you are everywhere and know everything with no limits, you really can't enjoy the experience. It requires limits and a lack of imagination. So he is like a parasite inside of you while you go on with your meaningless lives. It is why there's so much suffering on your plane. Your system requires the conflict to function. My system does not. We are his creation. But he didn't create you. The person you think of as God, the one holding the office now, isn't the one who created your system. He's an invader. Does it matter? <laughs> if it doesn't matter, why are we fighting? We aren't yet. And I suppose, being God, one can do anything they like. He smiles. His hands glow, but he doesn't even change attitude. Pink feels confined, <laughs> then squeezed as she begins to lose her breath and is a fish on the floor. He watches her flop around, gasping. He rises, picks her up, and drops her in a barrel of water. You see how easy it is to do anything I want. You justify believing in your own weakness because I appear stronger. But do you really know what you can do? Your problem is you don't believe that you deserve the power. I blame your parents. Or some loyalty to your god. Pink blinks in the water. She can feel the power just out of her reach. She's never had someone take the power before. She blows bubbles helplessly, frustrated. Aislinn and Otto stand in Mistress' place. He's focused in on the portal in the void. Nye holds it open, her face in deep concentration. Thane flies a tiny drone made of bones into the hole, and she lets it close. Can you see the feed? No, it's just crumpled into nothing. No signal. Uh, uh, that was my favorite drone. We will make a better one for you. Uh. We have to find a way to keep trying. I'm going to see Metatron. Back in Starlight, Pink and Cyric continued their conversation. You see, if you knew what I know, you would see how foolish it is. He sits in his ivory tower, preying on your weaknesses for his entertainment. Good and evil? they are just sloppy ways to tell you which side you think you're on. It's all really just the same. You and your little troop use all the same methods as evil uses, and you think that you're good. You were about to kill a friend's baby because you believed more power was to be granted. Is that good? Pink feels the band around her unlatch. She focuses on the taste of the magic in her mouth. She lets it build into sweetness, and is back in her human form, dripping wet on his bear rug. So you see, I am present with my creation, and it lives in order and harmony, not by the restrictive rules, but under its own steam. They understand that their actions have consequences. They know that they have an achievable path to be more. He makes you beg for power, for scraps, manipulating your morality for his game. Much like your friends Sprax and Resso, wouldn't you agree? Pink stands still, staring at the carpet. She channels wind to dry off. He stands up and crosses to her. He casts and douses her again. She shivers wet in the cold room. I like you, Uncultable. You would make a lovely pet for my lonely hours. Do you mean to keep me here then? Only until you understand what I'm offering you. You already long to be out from under the rules. Rules that restrict the numbers that bind you to one place or another? Once you stop focusing on the codependent system, the maths open right up for you. And unlike your god, the numbers never lie. What will I be if I can't quantify my actions? You will be who you were meant to be. So what do you think? Are you willing to listen to what I have to say? I don't know. What if I refuse to comply? Then you will suffer, just like all beings who resist order do. 
He flicks his wrist and she crumples to the floor in excruciating pain. Bands form around her wrists and throat. Kevin sits in his apartment going through the box from Thurston that Pink had left. It was full of journals and notebooks filled with stories. He flips through the pages aimlessly. A name he remembers catches his attention. He sets it aside, and the phone rings. Uh, hello? Uh, this is Kevin. Kevin? This is Mike down at the station. We're almost done with the season. Can you give me a couple scripts by Tuesday? Yeah, I have no idea for me. Uh, I'll, I'll have something by then. Okay, I'll wait for you to bring me something. Yes, you've got it. Thank you kindly. Kevin hangs up and goes back to the story about Brandish. He gets his notebook and reads, making notes. Zurich is planting seeds of doubt in Pink's mind. What will she do? Can he convince Pink to leave her system? Stay tuned for the next exciting episode of Chasing Tales. Episode 34, A Walk to Remember.